And yes, yes, the keen eyed of you will notice that that is the Carpentries logo upside down. And yes, yes, the keen eyed of you will notice that that is the Carpentries logo upside down. And I do apologize for that because one of the things that I actually kind of feel uncomfortable with, uh, with an unbridled passion, is the prevalence of activities that are named down under. And here I have managed to do it my very self. <laughs> so I take full responsibility um, and encourage you to look at this as an opportunity to think, what else can we turn upside down? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the um, Australia and Aotearoa, or New Zealand, um, uh, Carpentry Connect for 2024. I am delighted to welcome you here. Uh, here we are in Nam, Melbourne. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which we are gathering here today, and um, which are the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Boon peoples. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy. So there's a lot here. Uh, there already has been a lot of knowledge uh, here. So let's see what we can, we can do with that. Um, a few logistics that I would like to run through. Many people <coughs> here uh, in the Melbourne room have been here for the past couple of days. Can I get a show of hand for anyone for whom it's their first time in this space this week? Okay, we've got a few. Great, okay, so this slide is for you. Okay, um, please use this uh, QR code to access the welcome pack. And the most important thing on that um, is the, uh, the schedule for today, uh, which is customised for um, the A... Australian Eastern Standard Time, also for New Zealand Standard Time and Australian Western Standard Time. Uh, we run this as this is a Carpentries event and also an ARDC event. We have a code of con conduct gathering, mm, governing our activities today. So many Carpentries people will be use, uh, used to that. And if you feel you need to uh, reach out through the code of conduct, we have our on the ground um, person kit, um, please stand up, Kit Greenhill, um, who is your contact for doing that. There is also, for those of you online, there's a link to our processors in the welcome pack. Okay. This here in Melbourne, we're being photographed um, as we speak, uh, and we, um, uh, so I, I want to make sure that you're doing, you're okay with that, and we will be running. Um, we're also recording a few of these sessions, but not all. The recording in the room will finish at 1 p.m., which is also when, um, which is in, into, within three hours, we will finish our online connected presence and, and go, go out to our local communities. The nearest exits for the people in the room are back around the way that you came in and down the, uh, down the lift. Uh, the ref restrooms are on the way back around through the corridor. And um, uh, if you have any uh, dietary requirements, please, um, <coughs> Kit will keep an eye out for you um, in for our catering today. In lieu of speaker gifts today, we are making a donation to 15 Trees. And um, I would, the last two things I wanna do is introduce you to our skills concierges, um, my team from the ARDC, and we'll give a rough outline of our program. So these people here are my awesome team at the ARDC. I very rarely see them all together in the one room, so uh, it probably won't happen for another six months. Uh, but please uh, reach out to any or all of them if you have any questions about our organisation. Uh, there's, there's some of the trees which have just been planted. Amazing. Okay. So, how am I going to stop? Okay. Welcome. Today, our aim is to bring together Carpentries community across Australia and New Zealand 
for knowledge exchange, shared learning and community building. What we hope for you to get out of today is to find entry points into your uh, local carpentries community. Make connections uh, and find your people outside of those immediate groups. We want you to be able to exchange skills and knowledge in a positive and supportive learning environment, which is exactly what we uh, facilitate, encourage. And um, just, just imagine that I'm running a carpentries workshop right now. I am confident that we have the enthusiasm, the curiosity and the generosity in, the, in these rooms here, Melbourne and beyond, to accomplish this. So this is not a sit back and watch the presentations day. This is a put your needs out there and um, ask, ask for help and engagement. So keep me honest on that one. I will follow it up with a, a feedback survey at the end. Okay, again, we're a bit we're we're just going with that. Um, <laughs> so for those uh, for those of you who may be carpentry curious, I'm going to do a very quick um, uh, overview and then move on to our key stories today. We use the term carpentry in order to address the basics of computer programming, like learning how to nail two boards together or put up a wall straight. Each of our lesson programs has curricula that cover the basics of a particular topic. We create training in the gaps that is accessible, approachable, aligned and applicable. Um, the Carpentries runs peer-led hands-on intensive workshops from, um, through a network of volunteer instructors, lesson maintainers, trainers and community managers. The materials are open and collaborative and our work, the infrastructure in creating and supporting community is excellent, it's top notch. Before we, finally, okay, so this is the, the end of my blurb at the start. I'd like to share a picture of uh, the group of people who were the first instructor trainees in Australia which was shortly before the very first ResBaz uh, here at the University of Melbourne in 2015. These are the giants on whose shoulders we stand. So I'm, I'm pretty excited <coughs> um, that ResBaz is coming back to Melbourne um, in 2024, so nearly 10 years ago, which is amazing. So as I recover myself, I'm going to now um, hand over to a couple of people who have um, been kind enough to share their journey and uh, passion, interest and concern for the Carpentries. The first of these is uh, Dr. Pau Karale, and, um, who is a research scientist, um, an educator in atmospheric sciences. Um, and I have known Pau since we were trainer trainees together um, uh, early early in the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome her to the stage here to share her journey through the Carpentries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so when Liz mentioned uh, this idea of sharing our uh, journey through carpentries, I decided that I want to make a nerdy joke. So I'm going to talk about my voyage <laughs> through the carpentries. I don't know if you recognize uh, that little one is one of the voyage uh, spacecraft that is now going through interstellar space. And that is the path of Voyager, Voyager 2, and it's going to be my path through uh, the Carpentries solar system. <laughs> so that's me again. Um, I'm from Argentina, and I'm now here in Melbourne, so I'm going to talk uh, about a little about that too. So in 2019, uh, 18, um, I was uh, a first year uh, PhD student. I didn't know what to do with life <laughs> or my PhD. 
So um, I was doing a lot of things all at once. And that year I met uh, Raina Harris in the visit Buenos Aires. She's, uh, she was a, a very active trainer at that time and was visiting different countries talking about uh, the, the carpentry. And she uh, was part of an Our Ladies Meetup. I was an organizer at that point. And her talk that was presenting carpentry was really, really interesting. Because it wasn't, this is carpentry. It was, this is my experience through my PhD, the things that was challenging for me, my wishes for, for the future, and how carpentry helped me. And looking through the photos, I, I found this uh, slide from her that says in Spanish, uh, I believe everyone learns more when science and education are open and reproducible. And that resonated a lot of with me uh, at that point. But again, I didn't know what to do with anything, so things passed through. Um, I also participated in a, a small workshop, Carpentry, uh, Raina organized. Uh, it was like, like one day uh, Unix plus Git. And I was familiar with those tools. I was already doing a lot of things uh, for, for my PhD and, and my master before that. Uh, but it was interesting to, to know more about Carpentry. And I remember I passed all day looking at how Reina was teaching. No, the, the content itself, but how she was teaching the content. And, and I think that sensation was some kind of a break point to understand that education for me was really important. That's it was something that I wanted to do besides research. And um, because of that um, visit, um, they, after that, organized an instructor training for Argentina with all the trainers in uh, the US, in Europe, and different places. It was in English. But it was during a holiday in Argentina, during a weekend, because at that point, it was really difficult to go to your boss and say, hey, can you give me two free days to be part of this training? Of course, it wasn't an option. And again, I, I didn't know what to do. It was like, no, I have to read all these papers. I won't do this. So that opportunity passes, and, and I didn't um, went to the, the trainer. And in 2019, Carpentry was in the back. Uh, I, I started doing a lot of things. Uh, I was teaching at my university and in many meetups and things related to R and Our Ladies. And one opportunity that came was the um, Tidyverse certification. Uh, it was a, a program uh, run by Greg Wilson in our studio. So it was really close to Carpentry. Uh, Greg Wilson is one of the founders, for those who are new to Carpentry. And the, the program was uh, a training. It was shorter than the instructor training in Carpentry, but harder because it came with two exams. One to demonstrate that you know how to teach and design a lesson, and one to, know that, uh, to demonstrate that you know tidyverse. It was a, a, a door to the carpentry in a way because at the end of that year, someone told me, oops, sorry, hey, I followed the whole talk. Would you, would you like to be a trainer? <laughs> I was like, who, me? <laughs> What's a trainer again? <laughs> Names in carpentry sometimes are, are difficult. Particularly if you don't uh, know English enough. <laughs> uh, and the thing is, I didn't, I, I wasn't uh, an instructor, so being a trainer was something else. But the thing is also that I was very interested in, in teaching, not in, and, and, and the way we teach, not only in teaching tools. So I, I applied for that. And at some point, probably in December in 2019, I got the email saying congratulations, and I started the 
train the trainers, I think it's called, um, um, to become a trainer. But they told me that I needed to be also an, an instructor, so I had to do the instructor training too at the same time, including the checkout and the checkout for the train the trainers. So it was a very interesting time for me, a few months, and at the same time, COVID said hi <laughs> to the world. So, um, and that few months became uh, many, many months of interesting things. Of course, it was a terrible time for, for the world and still is, but for me it and for many people in Argentina, that corner of the world, it was a time of opportunities because things started switching to online and we were able to access many events, uh, spaces that were usually um, difficult to, to travel, to go, etc. So I started knowing people um, and being part of things that wasn't be able to, to do it before. But Carpentry was a global community, so Carpentry knew a lot about engaging with people around the world. Uh, so Zoom was a given, and, and teaching things, at <coughs> least the instructor training online was something that was at least familiar. To. So it was a good place to be during that time uh, because things were uh, happening all the time. It was interesting to, to participate. So being a new trainer uh, and with a few trainers in Argentina that or sp Spanish-speaking trainers, we started organizing things. Uh, we organized in 2020, we organized our first instructor training in Spanish. Um, it's a little challenging because the material is in English, but we, we organized uh, the, um, the instructor training and we added something else. We added uh, an, extra, um, an extra day, a three hours day, so people could do the checkout process with us in Spanish. And um, so they could participate in a welcome, uh, in a community session at that time in Spanish. Uh, they could um, do demo sessions in Spanish and they use mostly the translations for the, for the lessons we have in Carpentries. And we had a pull request party where people could learn how to use Git uh, and, and made their contributions to the lessons. We also did a lot of translations as contributions, but there were some uh, tada moments when the pull request was opened. So many of those participants uh, went through the checkout and most of them uh, became instructors um, for carpentries, first in 2020 and 2021 and 2022 again. Um, so it, at least from my point of view, this is very biased point of view, uh, carpentries started growing uh, in, in that part of the world. We had more trainers, uh, becoming trainers and being part of the team. And uh, one of the things that also happened during that time is that, I don't know if it's something from Latin America or it's happened everywhere, but we do a lot of synergy between communities because people are usually part of many communities. I'm part of Our Ladies or I'm part of different, uh, Latin are different are related communities. So we tend to do things together. So uh, I think those communities help carpentries to growing up and vice versa too. So here are some examples of carpentries workshops uh, that took place during our latest event, for example. And um, at one point I also became a uh, part of the trainers leadership. It's this uh, group of people that helps um, or oh, makes an interface between the, the the core team of, our, of Carpentries and the trainers community. And um, we get a lot of mo more trainers too, from uh, Argentina, but also from Mex Mexico. Mexico. Uh, so things keep happening there. And this 
uh, year, I became part of the board of directors uh, of the Carpentries. We have a session about that in, in a few hours, I think, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, and I've moved to Melbourne, <laughs> so that's something else. Um, I, I've been very happy to um, be here and uh, get to know you uh, and to start contributing not only to the Latin art community, because I'm still going to do that, but also to the, the community here in the region, because I've seen, I've seen you, I've seen what you've been doing all these years, and it's really interesting to, to be here, to be part of that. So, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, I, I wonder if any questions for Pal have come through online or... Um, and if anyone has any questions for Pal um, from the audience right now. Considering would I mean my question is Pal, can you can you train instructors in Melbourne? Can we can we imagine maybe something like that happening in the next few months? Yes. So I teach in English technical things. I haven't teach instructor training in English, but it's probably going to be something in the future. Uh, I, I've seen that happening. I've tried uh, a few years ago and things didn't work out, but um, yeah, it probably is going to be easier than in Spanish because we have a whole curriculum in that language. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm very excited. I believe it will happen. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, really? Excellent. Yeah, hi, Pat. It was a really interesting sort of... Uh, uh, trajectory about how you've done things. Uh, you know, the, the company has been around for a while. I think it was 20, 25 years or something else like that. And I'm sure it's, it's, it's grown and it's changed and it's morphed in all that time. What, what are the sort of... What, uh, what are the sort of challenges that you've just sort of seen and what are the challenges in your future uh, to keep it sustainable, because I think uh, a lot of people uh, w are working in these sort of isolated or less isolated pockets now, and thinking about you know sustainability of the community and keeping people engaged. What where do you see the challenges that Carpentries has to face, or might be facing now, that people could learn from or, or work together to help? Just a small question, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, so. There is a uh, probably an answer from Carpentries or the board of director point of view, but from my personal point of view, and speaking from Latin America, uh, I think uh, that the, the biggest challenge I still see is that it's difficult to explain to universities and organizations what Carpentries is and uh, convince them that it's something that they should uh, be open to, to, to work with. It's really difficult to convince an, an university in Argentina that they sometimes don't do enough for professors and teachers and TAs to help them prepare for the task and saying, hey, you can work with us, is something that they don't, they are not open to. So probably that will be, uh, but again, it's something personal and it's not, I'm not speaking from for carpentries. Thank you. All right. I'm going to keep to time um, and introduce our next speaker, uh, next key story, um, which is Tom Saunders. Um, who is an engagement specialist from the Centre for E-Research at the University of Auckland, um, where he coordinates delivery of research development workshops, including carpentries as a certified instructor. Um, Tom is going to talk to us about um, 
or raise some provocative questions about what it is that we're doing and are we doing it well? So. Hello, kia ora everyone. Um, thank you so much Liz and to everyone else who's, who's put time into organising this fantastic event. Uh, yes, so my name is Tom Saunders. I'm, I'm at the Centre for E-Research and I am involved in coordinating the, the research and development training workshops that we offer to primarily doctoral students and early career researchers at the university. Um, I myself uh, have entered the Carpentries community fairly recently in 2022. I did my instructor training and that was part of me starting the role that I have now. Um, and I sort of came from a place where I, I didn't I didn't have a lot of the skills that um that I that I do now and that I that I teach now. During my research, I learned a little bit of R to sort of, you know, build the car as you're driving it, but <clears throat> uh, I was definitely not um anywhere near as proficient as I wanted to be. And so that fed into part of the the sort of passion that I have now for showing people from all disciplines the the value of different digital research skills and programming languages and and how these sorts of tools and skills can be applied to their their work. Um, so we we teach a mix of of workshops um, in the center, a lot of carpentry's workshops, and we also are involved in organizing Resbaz Aotearoa, which is a a sort of a national scale Resbaz event that we deliver. Um, but yeah, the Carpentries is is just such a great uh, resource and it's such a fantastic entry we've found for, for researchers to get that initial confidence that they need to engage with, you know, what can often be quite intimidating tools and skills. Um, I think one of the main sort of um, points of 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 me delivering this this talk today was to raise a little bit of concern actually with with what I've seen. Um, I suppose I could just link it. Um, the sort of downward trend in the number of workshops that are happening globally. So the Carpentries puts out a some very useful feeds with uh, plots and statistics and things, and one of them. I put in the chat. I'm not sure if ARDC folks can can have that displayed, or if I should share my screen or something. Um, it's a plot that shows the 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 total number of uh, carpentries workshops that are registered centrally, sort of peaking in 2019, and then at just over 600, I think, and it's declining um, after that until now. Uh, the last year, 2023, it's sitting at about. 300 or so so about half what it was and i guess I, I wanted to put some some questions to the community and kind of um start a discussion about why that might be and if it is actually concerning or if there's an explanation for it i think we would probably all expect there, there to have been a fairly large dip from from covid it was a weird time and you know Everyone was kind of scrambling to keep up with that. But it it hasn't really recovered in the way that I would have expected it to. Um, and it does look like it might be leveling off a bit now with 2023 and potentially um, the, the current year. And it's also unclear to me how those, those global trends are reflected regionally. But I think the reason why I'm sort of concerned about it is because I think if, if we're not seeing that the number of uh, workshops being run that that we have in the past, and if we're not kind of growing and we're kind of contracting, that that's kind of concerning from a, um, a sort of a sustainability perspective. Like the the person who who just asked that question before, so I think there there could be a few uh, reasons for for seeing that downward trend. One one explanation is simply that um, we still are having the same a similar number of workshops running, but for some reason they just aren't being registered centrally with the carpentries. I think there could be a few reasons for that. In that plot, we can see that the sort of mix and match workshops are the only thing that um, that have increased. I'll just uh, share my screen to show everyone.
There we go. So I think we can see that the number of workshops increases up to 2019, and then it starts to sort of decrease uh, rather concerningly after that. But what's interesting is that the uh, the number of mix and match, the sort of color here, is increasing to the point where it kind of stabilizes and doesn't reduce as much as the other types of workshops. So it suggests that we're seeing a bit of a drop off in, in, um, in, in particular in um, software carpentry, this uh, sort of lime green color. So yeah, um, it could be that, that workshops are still running but aren't being registered centrally with the carpentries. And some of our um, experiences that we have with that is I think there is some there is some really good clear guidance in the carpentry's handbook about you know if you are only running one or two lessons from from something like software carpentry or data carpentry you can still register that with the 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 carpentry centrally but perhaps not everyone is aware of that um, if something isn't an official core lesson like um, some of the machine learning the machine learning workshops that, that we deliver. Um, at the University of Auckland, we don't register those because they're not um, they're not core curriculum. They're uh, incubator lessons that our people have actually some pretty significant contributions to. So perhaps we could be registering those. Um, so yeah, there's there's a few there's there's it could just be that um, they're not being registered. But I think that would still be a problem from that sustainability perspective because being able to demonstrate those workshops being run is is probably quite an important um, reporting metric and, and figure for the carpentries in general. If there are fewer workshops being run, then it could be to do with a couple of things around maybe the curricula. Are the curricula still fit for purpose? Um, how does the original intention of those curricula compared to how learners approach them now. For, so for example, you know, getting people into programming and giving them certain skills versus, you know, I think in our experience, a lot of learners come, come at it from the perspective of, I want to learn this particular tool. Like I want to learn R or I want to learn Python because I've been told to by my supervisor or because I know that that's gonna be something that's could be useful for my research. There have been some, some positive changes in this space recently, the, the data carpentry ecology R lesson looks really great. And I know that there's um, some talk around um, changing the, the get lesson, which is also really positive. I think those changes to the lesson were proposed back in something like 2016 though. So I think it might be a bit unclear for some of our community members what, what the process is and how much discussion is enough for, for, to get that kind of, um, those changes coming through. I think something that we have also struggled a little bit with is at what point do you fork your own version of the repository versus um, proposing increasingly extensive changes to the core lesson that perhaps don't align with the um, the way that the maintainers kind of see that lesson progressing. Another reason could be that that the audiences have have changed a little bit. Maybe the audiences' ex expectations have changed. A little bit from from that sort of pre-COVID time. Does that does the format still work for instructors and learners? Do we are we seeing people delivering those kind of intensive two two or three day sort of um, all day workshops, or are people kind of breaking those up a bit more? And maybe if you're you're breaking the lesson up into a smaller and smaller chunk, you you might not register it anymore because you might think, well, this isn't really a carpentry's workshop anymore. I think one of the really key things is how we frame the curricula and the workshops. So I think um, fairly early on, I sort of heard someone say, oh, well, why would, why would uh, someone in the arts need to know Python or something like that? And that kind of struck me as being odd because, I mean, a lot of the skills that the carpentries teach can open up all these amazing new um, kind of research questions and, and ways of doing things and methodologies. So I think when we frame the skills as just being generally good practice for modern research environments rather than kind of discipline specific, I think that really helps us to 
to sort of um, get through to the sort of non-STEM areas. The community is, is, is one of the real strengths of the carpentry. So not just having the curricula there, but actually having that community to kind of wrap around and support. Uh, I think one question would be what support do, do instructors have once they're certified? I know that there are the community calls and I know that there are um, particular community calls to help with delivering a first lesson. Um, but are there any, maybe there are some other opportunities or ways of engaging with instructors once they're certified to try to transition them into being more active parts of the community. And then just finally, I wanted to mention as well, the way that we talk about um, the carpentries within the community is, is going to be very different to the way that we talk about it to uh, the sort of decision makers or the, the people who at our institutions who have the power to really support them or provide funding to offer carpentries-based workshops. So I think it could be quite useful for there to be some, some resources around how do we pitch or promote carpentry's material at our institutions, at the people who, who make those decisions, and what kind of metrics are important for those people to see so that they can kind of understand the value and they can understand how, how using the carpentry's uh, workshops might align with their institutional priorities and that kind of thing. So that's kind of uh, an overview of some some provocative questions, but questions that come from a really genuine place and um, that I hope can maybe spark some discussions today um, in your hubs. So thank you again. Thank you very much for letting me have this opportunity. Um, and thank you to Liz for some fantastic conversations in the lead up. And back to you. Yeah. Um, we have Dr. Nisha Gatta, who is going to, um, he's training lead and community engagement um, specialist at uh, the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. Uh, and her, uh, is also a regional coordinator for New Zealand and member of the board of directors um, for the Carpentries. I'm going to welcome her. She's going to give us give us an overview of the what the board of directors has been up to. Um, Nisha, are you there? Yes. I sorry, it took a while for me to be unmuted. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, yeah, Tina Gotukato. Uh, I want to begin by formally thanking ARDC and Liz for providing us this platform um, to help bring together these wonderful community members from New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we are very glad that we can be here. Um, I do want to share my screen, given that I'm talking about things that a lot of us may not um, know much about. Uh, so um, as Liz mentioned, I'm part of the board of directors uh, of the Carpentries. Um, and for those of us who have been in the community for a while now, uh, the Carpentries had um, the executive council as a governing group until the end of last year. And from the beginning of this year, uh, they've transitioned into uh, a structure which now has a board of directors. And um, uh, there are a few of us here today who are part of the board of directors. So um, that's cool. Uh, so who are the current members? So I wanted to give you a quick overview of who are the members. Um, we've got a wide variety of people from various countries here. Um, Shani uh, is from Argentina uh, and is the vice president. So she holds an office within the board of directors. Uh, Tara's from Canada, um, um, Sarah's from Michigan. Uh, Pao, you just met Pao, um, do go and say hi to her if you're in Melbourne. Um, and um, myself, uh, Michael Smith, who's in the east of, uh, on the east coast of the States. Uh, Mark Crow, a lot of you in Australia might know him already. He's from Queensland um, and we'll be talking to all of you present at Melbourne a lot more in detail about what about the board of directors. So uh, this is just an overview to get you um, excited about his talk later. Uh, Conrad's in Germany. Uh, John's in uh, San Francisco. Yanetta's in the UK. And Ebony is also in the East Coast of the US. 
uh, as you can see, some of us had been elected and some of us have been appointed. So a lot of the people were appointed knowing that they were they were already in the community or had known people or had known to have co contributed to the community in some way in the past. And they were appointed directly to the board of directors. And some of us, uh, like Pao and myself, uh, went through an election process and were elected. Uh, so what 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 do the board of directors actually do? So uh, within the governance structure, of course, the uh, governance of the carpentries is overseen uh, by the board of directors and the executive director, who's currently uh, Dr. Carrie Jordan. A lot of you might know her. Um, so um, technically, executive directors report to the board of directors. Uh, this board is comprised of seven to eleven individuals. So the, the 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 rule there is to have seven to eleven individuals at all times uh, in the board, and whoever maybe um, they might be members of the carpentries community or um, they might be external experts invited to a specific um, um, to to give uh, their expertise on a specific topic. Uh, one third. Uh, one third of the board uh, are elected. So that's why some of us had been elected and some of us got appointed uh, to the board. Um, this was to make sure that there's a clear um, uh, diversity and representation across the board. Um, so we, as board of directors, we are expected to oversee any strategic and organizational planning for the carpentries. Um, and this is brought to us by the core team, uh, which is led by the executive director. So uh, there is a finance team, there is a program committee, um, there is a governance committee and an audit committee. So all of them look at specific issues um, and all of them have uh, a wide range of people from the committee um, answering any of these questions as they might come up or issues as they come up. Um, and board members are also expected to be advocates and ambassadors. So um, people like myself, Pao, Mark, uh, the fact that we can be here talking to all of you is also to raise, raise awareness of why, why we have a board of directors and what, is, what it is that we exactly do. Uh, some of us do have regional coordinator roles, um, like myself. Uh, so the, the, the expectation here is to make sure that the community is aware of the fact that we can be um, uh, mediums uh, taking your issues through to the core team and making sure that any challenges that you might be facing within your own spaces are addressed. Um, so this is a volunteer position. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful that Nessie um, allows me and supports me in doing so, um, because this, this is a position that enables community members to uh, uphold transparency in the organizational function. So what are our responsibilities? We strive to support the carpentry's mission and vision through our work. Uh, the code of conduct is also something that we constantly refer to and the core values. Uh, we ensure that uh, we are compliant with all the legal agreements and standards in place, uh, most of which is very America-centric, the US-centric uh, legal system, legal agreements that are in place. Uh, we try to offer expertise on organizational health and success, and that's um, that's a that's something that underpins most of the work we do. Uh, we actively participate in any strategic and financial discussions that may come up. And uh, we, as a group, we often provide feedback and vote on formal motions because not all of us agree on everything. So uh, it's pivotal to have voting systems in place. Um, we do dedicate four to six hours of our, um, of our lives, I guess, <laughs> per month to all the meetings and the discussions that happen as part of our role. So yeah, like I mentioned, there are standing committees. Um, currently there are four, audit, finance, governance and personnel and program. So um, all these standing committees, uh, we, we, we're, as board members, we're expected to serve on at least one of them uh, and no more than two. Um, we're also, um, we make sure that we serve on a specific standing committee that allows us to bring in our subject matter expertise. So uh, something like finance, I would be terrible at it. I have absolutely no understanding of how money works. So um, I am part of program and governance and personnel committees. Um, 
So uh, the board consists of the four uh, officers listed below. We have a chair, which is currently John Chadaki, um, a chair elect, Vice President Shani Valini. Uh, we have a secretary with um, Sarah Stevens uh, from Michigan and the treasurer, who's Michael Smith, that I had pointed out from the first list before. So um, they have specific responsibilities on, on making sure uh, some of the decisions become action items and are signed off on by the executive directors. And uh, these officers are basically the major decision-making figures who, who, who sort of, um, they bring together all the uh, uh, perspectives of the board members that they, that they put forth through the meetings and the discussions that happen. Uh, through the committees. So yeah, what what exactly is the purpose here? Um, I think we should always remember that the Carpentries is a community led um, um, uh, organization. It's it's a it's, it's something that has community at the heart of it, and uh, that is the driving force here when we advocate and uh, speak for um, uh, the organization in venues like these, and. Um, the, the board, of, board of directors is obviously there to to give guidance on some of the issues that may come up. Like we, re, like Tom brought up about the drop in numbers. That's something that concerns all of us. Um, so that's something that we would want uh, a bit of a discussion on, and to know what, how do we move forward? Um, how can we help community members? And of course, have accountability. Uh, the whole point of having community members as part of the board is to make sure there is accountability and transparency as we go. So, we are, New Zealanders are heading off to lunch, so I don't want to keep everybody. Uh, I don't want to wrap up by saying that um, the board is listening as a session on all of our programs coming up soon. Uh, Mark will be doing this in person at Melbourne. And because um, as Kiwis will be lunching at the time. Uh, I will try to um, do something similar for us uh, um, later on in the day at 3 p.m. our time. Uh, yeah, like I said, please say hi to Pao. She's just moved to Melbourne. Um, she's part of the board of directors. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And uh, thank you. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to people online who have joined us. Um, going to display my ignorance. Is there anyone online who's come back for the board is listening session? Yes. Okay, great. Hi. Um, so I'm going to hand over very quickly now to um, Mark and maybe Pau uh, and um, who are in the room here um, for the board is listening. So we want to hear what it is that you um, have to say about what the board is up to. Oh. Oh, okay, cool. So, to you. Mark. Thanks, Liz. Um, all right, so this hopefully, um, I'm hoping this will be a um, dynamic discussion over the next 25 minutes, otherwise it could be 25 minutes of awkward silence. Um, so, I don't have an agenda for the next half hour. Um, as the title says, the board is listening not speaking. Um, Nisha has given you a bit of a, a briefing as to what the Carpentries Board is all about, why we're there. Um, we're all volunteers trying to sort of make the community better. Um, and one way we want to do that is to obviously get input from the community. Um, they, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to hear from, from you as part pe people who are interested in the Carpentries, who are um, at various levels of involvement. Some of you I know are just learning about the Carpentries today. Others of you have been involved in it probably for longer than, than I have. Um, so please, I just want to have the 20 minutes, half an hour or so of your comments that you would like me, Nisha, Power to, to consider, to take back to the board, our next board meeting. Anything that you want to raise about the Carpentries that you would like us to, um, to discuss. Um, Miriam is valiantly going to attempt to take notes. So she will try and capture the essence of what um, you say. I think that link is in the program, isn't it, Miriam? S So for the benefit of those online, Miriam was just saying, yeah, go, go to your welcome pack. There's a link in there to the board is listening Google Doc. 
Um, she, say, she will try and take some notes, but if you have questions, comments, notes, that you want to either um, give more details after you've made a comment, or if you would prefer to just put comments <laughs> in there rather than speak, um, then we encourage you to do so. Um, so yeah, really that's what it's all about. Um, I will hand over just to see if anyone has questions that they would like to, questions, comments, issues, anything at all you would like to give to us as the board. Oh. Uh, yes, um, we've got one here. Hi, I'm Philip Dart here. Um, uh, I guess uh, I have a question about, in a sense, the strategic direction of, um, of carpentries. Um, and in particular, um, uh, I'm new to this, so I've kind of been learning this morning about what it's about. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering whether that strategic direction, whatever it is, um, I is intended to sort of broaden out in some way to try and help support HASS or other areas. Um, I think a, a lot of what you've got, I mean, I, I know we're aiming at sort of carpentry level skills, but some of those perhaps um, are going to be difficult for people in HASS or areas like that to sort of get into directly the way that people in STEM um, can make use of those. So I just wondered if you have a perspective on that. Right, thank you. Yes, so the Carpentries does have a, a five-year strategy, um, and I will try and have a look, unless Pearl is really on, on top of it while we're talking, um, we can try and put a link to that in the, in the document, because it is everything with the Carpentries we try and make as, as open and public as possible, so that will be available. Um, that strat st strategy is coming towards the end of its five years. So that is one of the priorities for the board this year is to look at the strategy going forwards. Um, those of you who've been around the carpentry or follow the carpentry so have done for the last sort of year or so will know that there has been some fairly major upheavals and they lost a lot of core team staff. Um, so one of the big strategic objectives for this next period is going to be um, sustainability and ongoing funding, uh, which was something that probably wasn't regarded as highly in that list as it should have been. Um, in terms of broadening the carpentry, we are looking probably in some ways at restricting the range of activities the carpentry does, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can't widen within those fo focus, that focus. Um, and I think there's a, a recognition with the carpentries and anyone involved in any research training that there's a lot of uh, support, need, a lot of opportunities within that has and similar communities um, that's probably not being well met by the setup at the moment. So yes, thank you for that. We will try and make sure that goes in there. Uh, Pal, if you do have any comments at any point, please just wave and grab a microphone and join in. <laughs> that any other? Oh. Yes, Rob, over from online. Yeah, so I just um, thought I'd <coughs> summarize some of the um, comments that came on, came up during Tom's talk because I thought they raised some interesting points that might be interesting. So uh, when when that graph was presented, there was this question of whether that drop is a supply or demand related. And then there was another questions later that suggested, well, hey, maybe those are related to the metrics of, of what's being counted, because there's a lot of people, myself included, that would have downloaded carpentry stuff and done stuff informally um, on our own. So if there might be other metrics that you use to, to define success. Um, there were also comments around, um, you know, the carpentry's lessons being being used used a lot in in a variety of capacities that aren't being captured, but also um, that there's a shift in in what learners might need because there's a lot more collaboration happening. And the last comment <coughs> that came up fairly largely was, you know, what's the the, the impact of AI? And is there capacity for the carpentries to sort of include um, maybe a training that goes, okay, you can ask ChatGPT or whatever it might be for some code, but then how do you interact with that code, improve that code, so you're not dealing with this, oh, I've created a bunch of code based on ChatGPT and I've got these huge error messages that I have no training in how to handle. So those were just some of the comments that came up uh, from online that I thought I'd pass along. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm just address a couple of those, if I can remember some of what they were. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that, that decline in numbers is obviously concerning, and we need to look into whether it's real, whether it's an artifact of reporting. Um, there is a feeling within the board that there is an increasing number of people around the world using Carpentry's material because it is open source and it's freely available, um, but not necessarily reporting it back to the Carpentries and in some cases not even attributing it to the Carpentries. So it's the Carpentries has had a massive impact on this sort of training worldwide, um, but what we need to do as a board is try and get more recognition for what has been happening in that contribution. So um, engage, re-engage with those communities that are using Carpentries and Carpentries style material to sort of try and say, can we get more recognition from that? Can we get back more involved in that? Um, but absolutely, there's, there's changes in how training is, people want, want training delivered. Um, one issue that we've seen certainly in Australia, and I don't know whether it's worldwide, is that um, since COVID, every university is completely panicked about their budgets. Um, training, as you'll all be very well aware, is something that gets easily slashed when people are penny, um, penny pinching. Um, so I think there's been an element of that there's not the instructor support and the trainer support to deliver training has probably not helped that um, decline that we're seeing. And that's one, maybe one of the reasons why it's carrying on after COVID. Um, and AI, machine learning, writing code, absolutely. Um, you can, we, we, are, we want to be, we, Carpentries is teaching people to do some basic coding. Why would you do Carpentries if you can get ChatGPT to write that basic code that does the same thing for you? So we need to be addressing that and looking at can we develop training material that is teaching people to use, use these large language models to write code effectively and teaching them the, the techniques to analyze that code, check it, make sure it's giving the right outputs rather than, as you say, sort of blindly trusting it. Thanks, Rob. Hey, Mark. Um, oh, right. Yeah, thanks, Yeah, uh, j just to, from, from my background, I'm not necessarily in the Carpentries community, but I sort of sit on the fringes of it. And it, Carpentries has always been a, a, uh, an exemplar of what we can do as a community that's open source and building on top of that. So it's been great to see the, the, um, the, the growth of it and the sustainability of it um and the openness of it and just going back to your point where you lost a lot of the core team uh you know in the last six months or so um as someone who's sitting on the fringes of the of the community i think it'd be really uh courageous and um informative to be able to sort of uh share those challenges with the community a little bit more because it took a lot of people by surprise and shock and um i think would be well one of the things we don't do well in e-research in my opinion is we don't tell the stories behind the the flashy stories and the bright lights here and so it can be very difficult to to say that, to ask someone to to know hey this happened how do, how can we learn from it and uh yeah i think it would be really great uh for the board if they can do it in a in a sensitive way that's not going to cause any problems to be able to share their experiences and, and what they're going to do to help smooth that out if they ran into that problem again hopefully not yep. but i could i could see that the other, just to going back to Tom's point around that, I the notes that I took in terms of Tom's points about why this drop off, yeah, I, I agree. Uni spending, ChatGPT, but uh, I've been asking a lot around different communities, in different forums, uh, asking, have people been seeing a drop off in volunteering efforts since the pandemic? about 75% of uh, people in this little informal survey uh, were saying yes, and 25% were saying uh, their communities were about the same or not. And I've heard other people from other communities in different forums sort of saying, yeah, we've seen drop-offs as well. Is there, do you see that in the carpentries as well? Not just because universities are penny-pinching, but drop-off drop in, you know, other, car um, in carpentries volunteerism that isn't relying on uh, institutional uh, push 
um, and you know, is do the does the board is the board taking this into account when they're making the decisions over the over the long term as well? Sorry for the ramble. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Uh, but I, I can't comment on whether carpentry seems has seen a drop off in volunteer activity because I don't have sort of data one way or the other on that. Um, what I can say is that that is another of the activities that is right at the top of our agenda at the moment is making sure we um, acknowledge and support and encourage volunteers. Um, because, yeah, the Carpentries is, has a, an, an interesting model that we charge membership to universities and institutions, and for that membership they get instructor training courses and so on, but the services that are delivered for that membership are on the whole delivered by unpaid volunteers. So the Carpentries is kind of selling on volunteer time to cover the operating costs. <laughs> um, so it is a, you've got to make sure that those volunteers are acknowledged, respected, um, because they are, their efforts are indirectly providing all the resources that the rest of the Carpentries needs to, to maintain its operations. So yeah, it's, it's really something they've tried to do for, for always, um, but yeah, it's, it's back at the top of the agenda now. With how do we really keep those volunteers engaged and supported? Sorry, Mark. Um, I'm going to ask this. Maybe it's a provocative question, so you don't feel like you have That's to answer it. if you don't. But it is just <laughs> following on that. So as we know that when the Carpentries was established, it was very much US-centric, US-focused. And in the US, a lot of companies will offer volunteer days. So like. The way you vol like volunteering in the U.S. is a much more co like common part of everyday life, where it, and it can be f like financially supported, not in the form of you get paid to go and volunteer, but your company will say like Google and Amazon and all the big techs will have volunteer days when staff are allowed to go out and do whatever they want for free as a volunteer to help the community. Uh, we don't necessarily have a culture of that in other places around the world, and ha because the board is also as uh, Nisha shared quite international. Has there been a discussion about whether this model of relying on sort of volunteer, like the model of relying on volunteers for things like instructor training, for things like training itself, whether that's something the carpentries may want to reconsider as it's going global? Like, you know, having the conversation of should we be relying on volunteers to do instructor training all the time? Or are there ways that we can, when we go to universities for money, also have a component of that to actually be paid so the volunteers get paid for the training as well as some of the over, like overhead money goes to the carpentries itself yes you're not, you're allowed not yeah to um, i mean <laughs> just, just so what i mean one aspect of that is that um universe when, if you're a member of the carpentries and you have a trainer in your organization the trainer is the person who teaches the instructors who then eventually deliver the training for those of you uh, i think um, Nisha and Power mentioning about all the, the jargon in the Carpentries. Um, if you have a trainer in your institution, you do get a discount on institutional membership if that trainer then supports the Carpentries initiatives by teaching other instructors. So they're not getting paid, but there is some sort of, there is some sort of feedback in, the, in that sort of one. So it's, it's certainly a model that um, exists at the moment um, to a level. Uh, I, mean, I think Power's coming up to, to rescue me, so Power, do you want to <laughs> so make some more I'm comments going on that? To <laughs> save Mark. No, no. I, the other thing that I s I seen but I have an experience is that um, institutions, universities, uh, or people working in those places have in their contract time for carpentry, so they are being paid for the work they do in the community, and that's that's some that's something great. I haven't experienced that, and and and. For me and for many people in Latin America, being able to do volunteering work is a privilege because we have, uh, we are in a good position, maybe work, study economical, whatever, and we have the time to give it to other pr communities. So I, th I think Carpentries knows that and try to acknowledge that to and, and to uh, recognize the work that volunteer people does. I, I don't know if we can convince uh, organizations in Argentina to give time to other communities right now because things are complicated, but that would be a, a, a good idea to try uh, in that those conversations between carpentries and organizations, see if people in those organizations can expend time for carpentries too. 
Hi, um, Cheryl from Federation University. Um, just sort of bringing together some of the things that have been mentioned so far. The open source nature of the content, um, the financial membership for institutions um, and sustainability. <coughs> what are the strategies being considered for promoting membership to organisations who can effectively access many of the benefits without actually coughing anything up? So, I mean, the main benefit to institutions is um, instructor training places. So when you become a member of the Carpentries, you're entitled to a certain number of instructor training places, um, which are normally, depending on which part of the world you're in, but they're normally around a thousand US dollars per head. Um, so that is the, the, the biggest value there. Um, so, Power, do you have other thoughts on any of those, any of the reason, ways around this? Um, no, can you repeat the last part? All right. Uh, um, stays in this room. My institution is an example. Um, some of us have done our carpentries instructor training on the basis of those extra places that are available for people at non-member institutions from time to time or through this group. Um, and... So we are able to access the materials. We've had the training. Our institution hasn't contributed. Um, so it's... Um, I, I think just that sustainability, you know, how do we... While maintaining our principles and, and the openness, um, actually have essentially the user's paying to some degree, at least. Okay, yeah, I, I, I understand and I think there are uh, talks related to that and, and to see how, to, because we are agree that things have to be opened uh, because I, I, I think that make us grow as a community and also other people grow. We need to find the balance so we keep the sustainability uh, and maybe work together with those communities or organizations that benefit from what we do uh, and, and we don't die in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I think many people share your concern and, and there, there are talks are about that, how we, we can um, interact with those organizations and help each other to, to keep going in the future. And I, th I think another aspect of it is, uh, coming back to the comment, comment we had earlier about sort of um, recognition and uh, the number of workshops and whether people are using <laughs> Carpentries material without us being able to track it. Um, a significant chunk of the Carpentries funding over the last several years has come from um, chari charitable donations um, and ph philanthropic donations. Um, and if that is to continue at a high level, what we need to do is de really demonstrate the impact that Carpentries is having around the world. So if we can, ca if we can better capture all these people who are using Carpentries derived materials, um, then it's going to become hopefully a little bit easier to, to justify those organisations making donations that then really boost the income above what we're getting from membership. So please make sure you, you lodge your, you report your things using the, the mechanisms that are done earlier and, and acknowledge Carpentries wherever you can. Um, I understand the focus of this discussion looks like to be a little bit more on the community aspects. Uh, so apologies if this question is not within this, this scope. Um, however, I would like to know the opinion of the board of directors that, um, regarding the whole process of not only updating the lessons, the content, um, but also incorporating new content. There's a ton of uh, cool, interesting lessons in the Carpentries Incubator, for example. So I think when we talk about uh, impact and that sort of thing, we really should account uh, for this whole structure that the Carpentries uh, makes 
possible and available for people wanting to contribute within the community. I myself find that it's a little bit difficult to make big changes, big revamps of, of lessons, um, and appears that many of them kind of uh, have a need for that. So I was just wondering if you have any sort of vision in terms of making this process more streamlined and easier for people who are keen to, to contribute and to make these materials more modern, more appealing, more engaging, and so on. Thank you. So first of all, no, no need to apologize for being off topic. Nothing's off topic. We want to get as many opinions as we can. Um, and you asked about the, the views of the board. I, I can't comment on the views of the board. I can comment on my views. Um, and that is, I think, one of the reasons I was quite interested in becoming a board member is that I, I agree with you absolutely. That it, the, the material up there is outdated. It doesn't get updated quickly enough. Things aren't rolled in from the incubator quickly enough. We really need to look at the processes to, to keep the training content that Carpentry has delivered a lot more dynamic and a lot more current. Um, there are initiatives going on in that. It's not really a board activity. Um, that goes out to the maintainer and the curriculum development communities and committees. Um, but yes, it's definitely on the, on the agenda again for things that we want to see this and we believe that keeping that that turnover and, and relevance of the training material is another area where the government really needs to, to focus on to keep sustainable and, and relevant. Just an additional comment on that is uh, I feel that the fact that there was this amazing work done by the core team of rolling out the new lesson template. Yep. Um, I feel like we teach Git and version control, but we didn't have like a, a version history of lessons. So I feel that maybe the new template is a, a chance, an opportunity for us to actually have like versions of lessons. And then if someone wants to teach a, an older version, they can just roll back, teach that one version if they're not comfortable with the changes and so on. But yeah, just, just my two cents. Sorry, no, this is just more a comment on that because one of the things that um, this has been a conversation going on for years and like as a disclaimer, I've been an instructor, I've been a trainer, I've been part of the community for a very long time now. And uh, one of the benefits of Carpentry's lesson, and I know there are like literally hundreds of workshops delivered through it using those lessons, for example, in New South Wales through Intersect and things like that, is you can pick them up and teach straight up. So they will work the way they are written. They have been, we affectionately call it beaten to death. And that can be so changing that can be tricky because when you make a change it may work maybe even for your community but then it may flip something else in a different community so there there's a reason they've they've been quite especially the core like the core r the core python the core git have been resistant to change is because they've just been hammered out um so i think that's like that's one aspect like that's for the core stuff that's why it's so hard because it's just like they just work and that's their strength, but also I agree their weakness. I think, yes, the process of going from incubator to core to lesson is, I don't know, like I'll, I'll just teach straight from the incubator. Like that's been the approach for now, which probably isn't sustainable because it doesn't show the breadth of diversity that the carpentries can do. So I think like there's, changing core lessons is great, but also keeping the core lessons is useful. Well, thank you, everybody. Liz just gave me the wind-up um, wave. So, um, yeah, that went better than I was imagining. Um, so thank you all for your input. Um, that was a really good feedback there. Um, appreciate we probably could have carried on for a bit longer. So once again, encourage you to jump online to that document if you have further thoughts you would like to put in there. Um, if you were either too shy or didn't get a chance to talk at this session, um, again, please put anything in there that you, that you want to add. Uh, me, Power, and Nisha will review that, and we will try and raise as many of those issues as we can at the next um, board meeting. So I will get out of the way briefly so Liz can reintroduce me for my next, uh, next talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Thank you, Pal. Thank you, everybody, for your interesting questions. Um, OK, so it's 12 o'clock now. Oh, OK, so I think I can get this. So. Welcome Aotearoa, it's two o'clock and we're here for the lightning talk session. I think I forgot to introduce myself today, so <laughs> if you haven't met me before, my name is Liz Stokes. <laughs> I work for the Australian Research Data Commons and the Skilled Workforce team as a lead development lead for trainer and researcher communities. And 
I have I've worn lots of hats around the carpentries community from um, joining the library carpentry advisory group sharing that for a bit and that was the start of trying to get my head around time zones <laughs> you know what some things never change <laughs> I can still get confused um, however today what I would like to do now is um, bring some wonderful stories across uh, from Aotearoa. Um, I'm going to hand over our first lightning talk um, is Mark coming back on again um, to share with us some uh, nifty tricks that the calf that QCIF run use for their running their training workshops. And I got to say, it's really great because I can just jump on the carpentry's feeds and see, oh yeah, QCIF are running carpentry's workshops. They're doing mix and match ones. They're not exactly the same, but they're it's visible enough for me to see. It's really important for for that counting. So without further ado, let's let's bring on the um, the excitement of a live demonstration. Thank you, Liz. Let's see how this goes. So just put that in there. All right. I'm sh I'm sharing my screen now. Tech folk, if you can put me up on there. Cool. That works. Excellent. Good, thank you very much. Um, so I am going in the tradition of carpentries. I'm going to do some live coding. Um, and also in the spirit of carpentries, I'm going to show you how to take something, a, a repeatable, a, a repetitive mundane task and automate it to try and save yourselves a few minutes a day or a week or whatever. So if you have organized a workshop, a carpentries workshop, you will know that for each workshop, you're supposed to set up a web page along these lines given the information about that workshop. Um, and there is a Carpentries template to do that. You clone it in GitHub, you make all your adjustments for it, you publish it. Um, that's not a terribly demanding task, but it does take 15, 20 minutes if you want to do different things to it. Like you see here, we have the QCIF logo. Um, we use Humanitics as our booking platform rather than Eventbrite. Um, we have slightly non-standard schedules of programs. So when I was doing this before, it took me eight, it took me half an hour each time to clone it and make all the adjustments I wanted to do. I then found out I could take one of my workshops and turn it into a template. So I've made all the changes and turned it into a Git template. And if I can get rid of this, I can see what I'm doing. I'm just gonna quickly show you now how easy it is for me to use that to create a workshop um, web page. And if something you're gonna be doing regularly, um, hopefully this will save you a few week, few minutes every now and then. When we do, we QCIF does, probably three, three Carpentries workshops every month. So that time does add up. So I hit create new, I do a new repository and I am going to take one of my templates that I've made. Let's do an R workshop. So I've saved templates for R, Git, Python, all the usual suspects. I'm gonna call it 2024, 05, 23, Carpentry con, and I'm going to make it public because otherwise no one can see my web page. And I'm going to scroll down and create that repository. I only have five minutes, so I'll do this quickly. But if you want to grab me at lunchtime, I'm happy to go through the process of making templates and all the other steps for this. And there we go, we have our site. And now to get that live with all the details I want, remember I've copied an existing one which has my logo, which has my timetable, which has um, Humanitics links. The only part of that I need to edit is the index page, index.md. We'll make it May, oops, the 23rd, 24th, May 3, 5, 24. So just changing these details here. Let's make me and Liz the instructors. Oops, I can't even type my own name. Those of you who haven't yet done carpentry's instruction, you may have heard that um, the, the errors are the pedagogy. We teach by errors, and when if you, a great way of making errors is by trying to type standing up. Um, and I'm going to put in my link to my um, booking page. Oops, it's going on there. Yeah, that's not good.
So I have just placed that in there. And we're not the March one, I'll do the July one because that's coming up soon. And with those few changes there, I'm going to commit those. And in a moment, once that's rebuilt that, I will now have my website for my workshop in just whatever that was, two or three minutes. While that's happening, the other part you're supposed to be doing for carpentry workshops is filling in the Amy form to register it. And again, this is lots of boxes here to fill in a name, email address, institution, so on and so on. Again, not a big deal, but can just be a little bit tedious doing it repeatedly. So I found that LastPass password manager has a fantastic form filling function. I don't use LastPass for anything else, but I do use it for this. I just have a, um, a free personal account, recommend you set one up and it is wonderful at filling in forms. So I'm going to get my password for the, um, come on. No, that's not what I want. There we go. And because I only use LastPass for one thing, I can never remember the password for it. So I have password for the password manager in another password manager. There you go. And now you can see I've opened LastPass and if I get rid of that box there. Now it's filled in my name, my address, my email address. It's filled in from the drop down list. So I say it's the great is a great form filling one. It does drop down lists. It does these radio buttons. It remembers all of these. Um, I would need then to go in and fill the workshop URL, start and finish date, because obviously those are things you can't automate. They are unique each time. Um, it's done my country and language. They're all getting drop downs. It's even filled in these I have read and agreed to things at the bottom. Um, it hasn't done the I'm not a robot because it's an honest robot. Um, and so just there's a few details there I would need to fill in. So all that clicking, all that typing, my name, address and everything it, multiple times every, every time I want to do a, so a batch of workshops, all done for me automatically. If you want to use this one, um, I said get yourself a free account. Fill the form in once, and before you hit submit, you go to here and you add an item. And it's this is one of the, the sneaky bits here. It looks like there's nothing useful there, but you scroll right down to the bottom, and then you do that save all into data. And that will then save the form, including your check boxes, including your radio buttons, including your drop downs, ready to go. And just to finish off, I'm not going to hit send on that one because obviously we don't want to register a non existent or a demonstration course, but I'm just going to go back here. It takes a couple of minutes for these websites to build once you've created all the data, but the, oops, that's the wrong one. What's going on there? That's because, sorry, I've got, yeah, why is it going there? There we go. That's, no, it's not. No. No, that's a Python one that I've got going on. But that's a real one. Okay. Maybe wonders of live training. Okay. I will just quickly check whether I forgot to hit commit. Um, no, it has me and Liz. Okay, let's go one more. Maybe it's just I'm um, not reloading. There we go, yes. All right, okay. I made a mistake there apparently doing it, but um, in theory that should have come out here. I'll give one more go to, oh, there we go. I just didn't have re heat reload, yeah, simple as that. So there you go, see me and Liz, um, the date's there, um, and we've got a link to the example site we used, July, our workshop. So. Maybe a little bit more than my five minutes, but not far off to create a workshop website and register it with a human with um, carpentries. Thank you, Liz. Oh, it's a long walk. I should maybe I should just stand next to the microphone. Um, then again, I I worry about that. Um, so thank you, Mark. Um, please. Uh, ping Mark um, if you would like more of those demonstrations or, or want to go deeper into that. Um, our next uh, lightning talk is a video um, which is from Paul Harrison who um, is with us online today. Uh, good morning.
Morning, my name's Paul Harrison, uh, and I'd like to talk to you briefly about some of our experience at Monash University running carpentry style workshops. Starting at the beginning, at least for me, uh, as a bioinformatician, back in the day I might write some reports in Knitter, and then sometimes the re recipient would start learning R, which was pretty marvellous. Around 2015, in the bioinformatics platform, we started actively teaching these sorts of skills to the people we were working with, and that was possible because we'd found the software carpentry, the lesson materials were great, they also had a whole format for giving workshops in, so we could start developing our own workshops along similar lines, but with more of a bioinformatics focus. Uh, as we did that, we started thinking about what's the best value we can provide to the uh, attendees. We were noticing things like ggplot and data frames were very powerful. Later, dplyr and the pipe came along. Uh, so this was offering a form of fluency, but not exactly programming or software engineering. So obviously this is paralleling what happened with the data carpentry development. Uh, we sort of ended up creating our own material, I think, around about the same time. In 2018, the Monash Library wanted to run some workshops along the same lines as we were running in the bioinformatics platform. So we partnered up. Um, we skilled up with the Carpentries Train the Trainer training more people involved across the university, we started offering more frequent workshops and advertising them university-wide, uh, aiming at postgraduate students. Uh, they have a certain number of hours of development they need to do as part of their program, uh, and also at staff. Also, we started having some community building uh, activities. So we also have drop-in sessions for one-on-one -on -one help that have continued to be very popular, also things like seminars and a book club. In 2019, things scaled up again. Data Fluency hired some associate instructors, we called them, so paid instructors who could run workshops much more frequently. Our hiring process, we sort of took the uh, live coding exercise from the Train the Trainer, and made that part of the interview. Um, and so we scaled up to much more frequent workshops. Now, of course, in 2020, we had to switch to online teaching. Now, we've generally been doing sort of one-day workshops. A full day on Zoom was pretty tiring, so we switched to two half days. And in fact, that would be our preference now for in-person workshops as well. A full day really fills up people's brains a little bit too much. Um, turns out it's actually simpler to run Zoom workshops. Uh, finding rooms had always been a problem, so we seem to have fallen into continuing to use Zoom after the pandemic. Though, I must admit, something is lost on Zoom, some of the interaction and connection. But still, there's a quality to quantity all its own. So. Here's some statistics from 2023, reaching a large number of people. We're doing monthly R workshops, monthly Python workshops, and then a whole bunch of other topics and more advanced versions of the workshops. And this whole process has involved a huge number of people. People are very enthusiastic about it. I'm sure I've missed quite a lot of names in this list. Uh, Things maybe did die away a little bit during the pandemic. Uh, and so in terms of restoring a bit of more community around that, Monash E Research is going to be holding a Resbaz in November. Uh, so yeah, I was saying that I'm going to talk to you today about the Software Carpentry Governance Committee and what is it that we're doing now and we have been doing. Um, and coming from CSIRO, I joined uh, CSIRO about a year ago when I moved to Perth. And if you want to know a little bit about my background, um, please use that code. 
The next one, please. I will just set that just the title and that we are very happy to have a profile. Thank you. Next one. Okay, so this is the story of how the government governance committee uh, came to. That happened earlier this year, or I think, yeah, probably earlier this year, just a few months ago. And that was part, well, the process was, and again, it's, there is more information um, uh, in the QR code if you want to know. Summary is that there were two committees, the CPC and LPGC, we merged. And now we're a single committee, um, which is we will call uh, the governance committee. The next one, please. So the LPGC is a lesson program governance committee. That's basically a committee that is in charge of auditing existing lessons, um, so what we call the core lessons. Uh, that trying to answer the question that are we teaching what we need to, te to be teaching? Is the content enough for the people who are actually used uh, as a source, as a resource uh, for content? Uh, we also um, uh, promote uh, new lessons, so we check into the indicator and that, the capitalist indicator and the capitalist lab, and see what new, any new content that could be included in the core lessons. We, um, the curriculum, so we take try to take care of the big updates that need to be made. And we were we're going to talk about one of the main uh, big changes that we have been discussing during the last few months, which is the give lesson uh, later this afternoon. Um, and then the general governance. So, for example, we took a look at the website and what changes, when, what what information in the website needed to be changed, and uh, how we wanted that website to look like. And yeah, that's that kind of. And then there is the group, so it was part of the lessons program governance committee where when the big changes early this year happened. And then there is another committee which is called the curriculum advisory committee. So you probably are more aware of that. And those are the ones who actually approve the changes. Um, and they have a uh, full well, consultation rubric, which we're going to take a look in a second. And they are more like more the structure. That we want to follow going forward. And then we also take into the governance so that these two ex were existed previously. And what we did was just merging those two, uh, including the tasks that each of the committees uh, used to do. And now we are also, well, yeah, trying to help as much as we can with the core team when needed and provided a reduced capacity and that happened earlier this year. So we basically, with all the changes early this year, um, we're giving lemons and we're making Next one. Now, major changes. So I want to talk to you about a little bit of the process that happens when someone suggests or there's a discussion in the community about making big changes. Uh, this is the uh, rubric that I was um, preparing to. So there is uh, a lot of data in that uh, QR code, but it's basically a document. No, it's a like, like package example that uh, specifies what needs to happen if you want to make a change uh, from whatever role you're playing with it in, within the community. So there are issues that need to go over that maintainers have full uh, authority, uh, and then there are issues that maintainers need to discuss with the CAC, and then there are issues uh, that uh, it would be good. That maintainers discussed with the CAC and so on. So there are different scenarios when maintainers find out that there needs to be that there is a need for a change to happen. And what we wanted to do, and we wanted to do um, going forward, is just um, yeah, taking up that role. Um, so basically, all that I'm saying is that whenever maintainers and that the maintainers come with what instructors also uh, tell them about delivering the content of the lesson. If there is a need for, for a change to happen, maintainers were kind of the channel between maintainers, again, maintainers community and the structures and, and the core team for that, those changes to happen. And the reason why we exist in that middle, like I said, that middle ground is to be to facilitate the communication uh, between the different groups within the community. So it's easier to make those changes. Someone needs to sit down and say, okay, we need to make this and this and this, and this is how we're going to do it. And that's kind of the role that we want to take in. For example, the kids lesson, and we're going to 
have a whole discussion uh, later this afternoon about uh, the heat lensing. And for example, uh, one of the big changes uh, that has been discussed is the story behind that lesson. So, Woman and Dracula, you can please kind of, well, I guess it, was, it used to be very interesting. Okay. But it dates back to 1931. So, it's a very old story. And just the way we're going, uh, one of the main topics for discussion with the kid lesson. We want the lessons and the content, even if it's relevant. I mean, let's put aside how relevant is the actual content of the Git lesson today. But we want our lessons to be, yeah, captivating, to be catchy. Um, those stories need to be, um, yeah, designed and, and thought with with some the, the, the audience that we want to target, and that's not very catchy for your generations. So starting with those. But then, then when you think about what's needed to make changes on the story behind the youth lesson, there is a core workforce that is needed for those, those changes to happen. So we'll still have the lesson today, the youth lesson today, exactly the same story. Um, so that's only an example. And that's one of the motivations for a later discussions today. Um, and that's sort of the yeah, topics that we have been discussing. Uh, as part of the you know the discussions of of the committee, part of the yeah, earlier stages of the committee was more about understanding what we were doing and why is it that there is a committee and why is it that the community needs us and what are we going to do about it? And then now that we have you know like agreed on on, on the role of the committee, and now we're going to try to put um, all the effort that we have in moving the resources towards the changes that need to be made. us and um, the community is three people um from different countries so some is in the uk and she's well we're and co-chairing the um the governance committee with her and uh, she's an instructor and a trainer uh and then martino is in italy um so he's our secretary um and he's also an instructor maintaining instructor and trainer uh within the community in the community so this is how you can get to us. Again, Slack is another challenge that we can use, but feel free to um, reach out to us if you have any questions or yeah, well, directly to me if I can answer any. Thank you. I think that's the last one, Liz. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Valentina, for that. So now we're going to hand over to another speaker from Earth, which is Emily Barker, who is going to, you know, it's this pun. This is why, actually, um, because um, Windows on Carpentry Community in Western Australia, um, uh, and what the what people are doing at the University of Western Australia in the HPC um, area. So, Emily, please uh, assume the stage. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, nice and clearly. Cool. Um, I did go around in Western Australia and speak to other people doing carpentry things in Western Australia so that I'm not just covering UWA since we didn't have other Western Australian people speaking. Um, first of all, I just want to do a quick acknowledgement of the Wajuk Munga people whose land I'm presenting from today and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm from the UWA HPC team. We teach carpentries several times a year. We teach software carpentries, and then we teach HPC carpentries. HPC carpentries is currently in the incubator phase, and they are doing quite a big push to try and get that approval level so that we can have you know, rubber stamped lessons that we're teaching and that everybody's teaching similar things. Um, so we are quite a small team. There's only three of us. We will teach anywhere from 20 students to 60 students in a room. Um, it's generally always in person uh, and it's a lot of work. So part of the reason we're quite happy to have a hub today is so that in Western Australia, we can have a discussion about how can we be teaching these things together in the carpentries community in Western Australia. So there are quite a few other things going on over here at Curtin University in the Institute of Data Science. They teach software carpentries and data carpentries. 
They do refer to it as Carpentries inspired lessons because they've cut things down to a day. Um, a lot of people don't have time for an entire week and so you'll get more students coming in if you can keep things quick for them. Uh, also with the Astronomy Data and Computing Services, so ADAX, this is an Australia-wide uh, organisation, but they part of them are in Perth. Um, and they have been teaching for three to four years in the Carpentries format, but it is not Carpentries lessons. They have started submitting things to the incubator. So again, there's a lot of new content that different areas in Western Australia are creating and submitting um, to be lessons for the Carpentries. Uh, so there's a couple of other few little things going on. Valentina is quite new to Perth, so her area of CSIRO are starting to look at how they can start to use the Carpentries to teach people at CSIRO data skills. Uh, Pawsey, we've got Anne and Fathima here. They don't teach Carpentries here, but there is a lot at Pawsey in terms of trying to use the ethos of Carpentries when they are teaching things. So how can we make people feel comfortable in a room and how can we make everybody feel welcome in this space? Uh, we also have the ARDC hub at Curtin, so they just help out with a lot of Carpentries things, I think. Um, Matthias and Anne from Pawsey are both Carpentries trainers who are helping out uh, from Perth. So, yeah, mostly new content and uh, how can we use Carpentries to help people feel more welcome in a data space. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. And now... We're going to head over to our New Zealand counterparts. So first up will be Nisha uh, talking about Nessie collaborations with the Carpentries. Thank you, Liz. Um, so to mix things up a little, uh, Murray, Tom and I, we had initially imagined this to be one long presentation. So of many lightning talks, so bear with me as I get to my slide, because I was going to go last, but I'll now go first. So oh. um, Nessie is, <laughs> no, no, don't worry, I'll, I'll go first and then I'll hand it over to Murray and then um, Tom. Um, yeah, so Nessie is uh, the National um, um, uh, Insti Institute for Infrastructure for HPC in New Zealand and Training is one of the services we offer. Um, and I think just to sum things up um, on the larger uh, scale of things, what, what, what is exactly happening in the country? Uh, we've got ResBez Aotearoa happening soon from the 8th and the, to the 12th of July. We have a week long uh, event full of workshops, mostly carpentries workshops, foundational level workshops offered to um, 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 researchers across the country. Uh, we've got several institutions um, coming together um, to to teach and to to um, uh, run this event as well. Uh, and I think Tom will speak more to this because this is an event that he's leading. Uh, introduction to Python is in here because uh, Nessie um, has recognized a demand within the community to to teach introduction to Python again. This has aligned with some of the discussions we have had on the machine learning and AI training front that uh, researchers have expressed um, a need to go back to learning the basics of Python because um, that's something we haven't done nationally uh, in a while. So this is part of a discussion we are having on the national software carpentry co coordination front as well, uh, that what can we do um, to help people meet this demand? Uh, and we are hoping to schedule something in late July or early August on that front. Machine Learning 102 Image Analysis. This is uh, this is a workshop that's completely focused on just Im image analysis, mostly on the Nessie HPC system. Uh, we are hoping to run this one in September as well. It's a workshop that Nessie offers um, every quarter um, or tries to offer it every quarter. Um, so hopefully the next time we run it would be in mid-September. Uh, just a bit more detail around the National Software uh, Carpentries co Coordination Front. Uh, Murray, Tom and I, along with um, uh, Anton Angelo from the University of Canterbury, and previously we've had a lot of help from um, folks from the Victoria University of Wellington, people like Hayden, Constantina, Matt, 
uh, Matt Plummer, who's, who's, who's leading the hub at Wellington. They've been wonderful in bringing this effort together. This is just a national um, effort of this tiny group coming together, trying to figure out what workshop can we do, who can teach, who can help, what can we do. So um, as part of that effort, regular introduction to BASH sessions um, are being run every quarter, or at least we're trying to run it every quarter. We did that last year, and they, we recognized that people did see uh, value in it. Uh, we do welcome interest from anyone who's available to help or to co-instruct um, software carpentry lessons. Uh, and this goes back to that larger discussion we were having on Zoom uh, earlier today about why are the workshop numbers going down? Can instructors really find the time to teach? Um, and this has been a challenge on our part, at least, that you know, instructors are just quite busy, bogged down with their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and I did say that we will do a live poll, but this was when I thought that we would do like a like a thing, uh, like a combined lightning talk. So I think we'll circle back to this at the wrap up session instead of doing it now. So sorry about leaving it in there. And should I hand it over to? Yes, whoever is easiest in in the in what is the remaining order of the slides, if that's okay. possible. Yeah, thanks, Les. So maybe Murray, you go next. Um, hi, I'm Murray. I am a scientific programmer at the University of Otago. Um, I suppose key different key things about what's going on at Otago is that uh, we are the only institution or university in New Zealand that actually has a Carpentries membership. Um, so the other body is NISI. Um, we've got a lot of, as Nish has pointed out, we've got a lot of um, nationally collaborative efforts going on. Um, so we've got the BASH, uh, we've got Research Bazaar. Um, at Otago specifically, we um, tend to offer sort of the, the mix and match style of workshop, um, being that we pick out largely the introduction to R um, content and offer that as a single day workshop. Um, we have two of the trainers at Otago. So in New Zealand, there's three active trainers, two of them are at Otago, one of them being myself. Um, additionally, we have the Carpentries adjacent training. So there's stuff that Nessie's operating, um, but there's also Genomics Aotearoa, which is a national collaboration for bioinformatics research and training that's um, hosted by the University of Otago. And they um, offer many Carpentries-like or inspired workshops, so we offer support um, in that aspect as well. Um, and then at the end of the year, we also run a five-day bioinformatics workshop, which is based on the data carpentry genomics workshop, um, and then extended into other bioinformatics um, training. Um, we've got a very heavy health sciences, biology-focused um, carpentries training stuff, and we're starting to go more... Um, general and locally we've got a, a new cluster sort of coming online so we're use, going to be using the um, carpentry's material to upskill researchers um, as we bring them on to that platform so that's probably a good spot to hand over to Tom Yes, thank you Murray um, Yeah, so this year we the Centre for E-Research ran uh quite a few carpentries sessions. We ran a couple of data carpentry. We tend to run the Python one from software carpentry by itself. And we've also developed a um, introduction to machine learning workshop that combines two incubator lessons. Um, one of those is introduction to machine learning with scikit-learn. And the other one is introduction to deep learning. So we teach the machine learning one um, each of those lessons is, is split over two afternoons, so it's a four afternoon uh, workshop. S similar thing with the data carpentry, we teach um, spreadsheets or what we've kind of uh, rejigged into tidy data on the first afternoon, open refine on the second, and then we split the R content over the Wednesday and Thursday. 
Uh, we've talked a little bit about the collaborative bash with Otago and and, and Resbaz. So Res, Resbaz Aotearoa is um, a, a sort of a national event rather than a, an institutional event here. Um, the organisers have uh, representation from University of Otago, Victoria, University of Wellington, University of Canterbury, and also Plant and Food Research, one of our Crown Research Institutes. And of course, Centre for E-Research, I'm, I'm there as well. And we, we we often teach quite a few carpentry sessions in, in there as well. So we this year we'll be doing R, Python, Bash, and the R lesson we'll be doing four-hour version of that, so sort of roughly half, or we'll be using the new um, data carpentry ecology R lesson for that. So we'll trim it a bit. We have been playing around with the concept of follow-up sessions after the workshop. We're quite keen to try to offer a bit more support for for learners, come back to them afterwards, give them a little bit of bonus content and see how they're going and, and if they've started to use the tools or what they're finding challenging or um, that kind of thing. So we're kind of in early days of that. And then I think next year we'll probably start we'll teach Git again that just – it wasn't a conscious decision not to teach Git 2024. We just, it just didn't quite make the the lineup. And we're always looking at how we can rejig or reconfigure what we do. So we'll probably end up playing around with some of the, the formats, some of the, the lengths and that kind of thing as our audiences change. So that's me. Thanks, Tom. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to sort of um, talk a bit about was the were the challenges that we had, um, you know, the three of us, um, general from our institutional point of view, and nationally, um, the silence. How can we make it better? So, silence from the community. Um, Slack or using Slack is often a challenge, even within Nessie. We have people who use the Nessie Slack channel exclusively and then don't go on to the Carpentries channel. They forget it exists and then, oh yeah, I should go back and check. And then there are institutions that don't have a Slack um, or, or they don't use Slack enough and they sort of forget um, about checking Slack out. So um, how can we make the engagement side of things a bit better? Uh, that's something that we're always wanting to um, do better. Um, getting new or existing instructors to teach. So one thing that we wanted to, uh, or we hope to keep working on through the Software Carpentry National Collaboration is to support newly minted instructors uh, through the through the instructor training to, to give them a space to teach if they haven't uh, been teaching before or 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 don't have an opportunity to teach within their institution making sure that they have a space to do so and if you are one of them and you haven't taught yet please reach out to us we'd love to get your help on that um, teaching something new um, going beyond the intro workshops and, and you know, like providing ongoing support um, to researchers um, and, of course, lack of institutional funding for in-person workshops and community uh, events. So one thing that we've often noticed is um, with uh, Carpentry Connect for New Zealand, for example, we tried to co-locate it with eResearch New Zealand Conference, which is the annual conference in New Zealand. Um, it's it's it it seems like a good fit to co-locate it then because then uh, researchers don't have to ask for extra funding to travel uh, for an in-person event and we recognize that as a challenge especially with the with the recent you know post-COVID times that we are living in people are just more comfortable institutions are more comfortable pe with people attending online events but of course we like as as a community, we know that it's it's better when it's in person. It's different when it's in person, and those community discussions you have are pretty important to um, to to communities like ours, which thrive and and grow because of these discussions. So that's there as one of the challenges, and of course, trainer availability. Again, one of the things that came up on chat when we um, when Tom mentioned that you know the drop in numbers. Uh, the workshop numbers, trainer availability was one important factor there. And of course, better representation from wider research community and domains. Um, 
as somebody from the humanities myself, um, when I came to New Zealand, not a lot of people talked about digital humanities and I, I didn't really have a community to go to. And digital humanities, I think, could be better represented in the carpentries um, because there's a lot that they can take away from the foundational lessons there. Um, and of course, better representation from communities like these or domains like these, research spaces like these that um, may not know about what the carpentries has to offer. Uh, for New Zealand uh, in specifically, uh, the Crown Research Institutes um, and their participation and support is something that um, NACI definitely is constantly working on. We would love to have more CRI participation and support, knowing well enough that it's it's um, that's a challenge on their part as well. Um, finding the time and the space to be involved in um, in efforts like these. So, leaving you with the challenges and slowly inching closer to the wrap up. Uh, some of the opportunities on the horizon for us. Um, or New Zealanders, um, machine learning workshops by Nessie. Uh, it's open to everybody. Um, please do uh, subscribe to our training uh, newsletters. Um, it's free. It's online. Open to everyone. Uh, CER, like Tom mentioned, uh, also offers machine learning workshops uh, for the University of Auckland uh, researchers. Um, they are specific and they are carpentries focused. Please do go and have a look at those lessons as well. Uh, you can sort of see the difference between the two. Nessie uses a scikit-learn slash carpentries model, which is a mix and match, and CER does something that's slightly different, more carpentries. Um, the range of workshops at Resbe is always a wonderful place to go. Please do check that out. We have a website now with the schedule. Um, Workshops at the University of Auckland, uh, University of Otago, sorry, and bioinformatics workshops through the NSCGA Path Training Partnership that Murray spoke about. Um, these are regular workshops, bioinformatics focused. Um, again, the NSC training newsletter would be a good place to subscribe to if you're interested. The, uh, the national collaboration, the quarterly community calls with Australia. So this is something that we started last year. So ARDC with... Um, Liz helping me out with this. Uh, we try to coordinate regular community calls with Australia. They started out as quarterly community calls. We got some feedback about making it more regular. So we've tried to amp up the cadence a little bit there. Uh, the uh, Carpentry Slack channel is a good place to go if you want to keep an eye on that. We also have um, Etherpad links and community calendars in the Carpentry's website, which should have all the community calls listed out for the year. Uh, Birds of a Feather sessions for the Carpentries community um, in general, the Birds of a Feather sessions are rather useful. They are a great place for this trans-Tasman discussion to, to happen, for people to just sit down and have a discussion about what's on their minds, what are the institutional challenges. So please do keep an eye out for that. I think the next one, Next opportunity we might get is e-research Australasia and then e-research New Zealand. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. Uh, the next instructor training session. So we are trying to figure out a good time to organize the next instructor training session for New Zealand. Um, we are looking to schedule something between August and October. So hopefully we can figure something out soon. And e-research New Zealand 2025. So Nessie is hosting it next year. Yay. But we don't know where it's going to be. Um, so uh, for now, I do hope that today we get some time, at least in the next few sessions that we have uh, for the rest of the afternoon, to figure out what people's thoughts are on doing the Carpentry Connect event in person next next year. Uh, as part of e-research New Zealand, which is usually where we do it, but we would love to have our Australian colleagues there. We'd love to have you come and meet us in person, which would be great. So, yeah, leaving that in there and a wrap up. So, wrapping up, um, do join us for the feedback for the board of directors session that uh, us New Zealanders lost out on because we went for lunch. 
um, at 3 p.m. So that's in 10 minutes. Uh, we'll also have a wrap-up session there where we can sort of bring all these open-ended conversations that we have had until now um, so and see where we go from there. And we will hopefully wrap up everything by 4 p.m. before everyone has to go home for coffee time and the Zoom fatigue sets in. So thank you from Tom, Murray, and myself. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Nisha. Um, and we we had a really excellent um, board is listing session, and Miriam has taken copious notes. So I uh, I hope that um, there will be lots for you to riff off on. Okay, now it's my lightning talk turn, um, and so I'm going to try and keep this short um, because uh, I'm the only thing between me and my own wrap up business. So um, I will respond to Lars' gestures as well. So if I'm going too far, I'll try not to. What I'd like to do, though, is run a little lightning talk and tell you about the ARDC Carpentries Partnership and what we've learned through running a, a, member, a membership with the Carpentries, which is focused primarily on delivering instructor training at scale. So... We wanted to run a partnership because it would provide us the opportunity to have lo local, as in national, coordination, encourage collaboration between different partner organisations, both for that um, the shared niches, the specialists in uh, different organisations that would find their people uh, together, but not necessarily in on the same campus, and then help us um, bring more connections internationally to the Carpentries community, also as a capacity building exercise for the e-research digital, digital skills trainers across Australia. Uh, and that, that means serving or providing professional de development for our trainer community, as well as research mentors who f see this as a key part of their ability to run peer-to-peer -peer, uh, workshops and skills training. So, let's do this. Um, we started by bringing five local trainers together to deliver instructor training to um, Australia and the world. Hang on, I've just got to go backwards. All right. Um, and include the um, incentive for trainers to complete the certification. And so here are the organisations who joined us with, that, um, with the partnership uh, to start. They were able to join by paying for instructor training seats and we did it at an incredibly super discount of about 600 Australian dollars, which down from um, $1,000 US for um, a, a member's instructor training seat or mm. for if you're not a member, which is more like $1,500. So it's quite a discount there. You can see we have, we attracted a, quite a spread of national infrastructure organisation. So we've got... Um, PAUSI and NCI, our major national high performance compute um, facilities, uh, training organisations, QCIF and Intersect, and, um, uh, and then Arnet and universities from west to east. Uh, and that's something I'm really proud of. Um, also, the new kids on the block who joined um, after we started um, were the Burnett, Burnett Institute and the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And I got really excited thinking, oh, wow, even people in a, like in a, at a department level are interested in this and can see, um, see some promise here. Okay, and so what happened? Well, <laughs> we ran a lot of training. So we, we were able to um, run that training across 121 um, people who, who turned up. That's the, the attended and completed instructor training. Um, we had out of that over 20, for the last two and a half years, we've had 41 people make it through to certified instructor status uh, and with a much bigger proportion in the first year and then the, um, than the second year there. You can... I've. In the middle column there, I want to kind of show you um, the spread of which seats people indicated, how, how many people have um, gone through an attended training 
and in brackets is the number of people who achieved certification. And so some things that I've observed about how we ran that training have been, ah, oh, well, it's kind of difficult to see who is running Carpentry's workshops. So really, it's, it's only been the organisations who are paying their instructors to run it or who have um, a casual pool of instructors um, to run these workshops. So that's where it's easy to see opportunities like um, Monash and their data fluency program and QCIF having run um, and having visibility about their Carpentry's workshops. Another thing that happened um, is that uh, in, instead of in the first year, it was kind of easy to run this program by the exchange of seat. Um, and we thought, we thought that would be kind of easy, that you pay for a seat and then we would provide you the training. But we discovered that that actually became quite a difficult thing to do through, um, through a necessary contracting stage. So the incentives to actually grow the partnership um, were not as strong as we had imagined uh, at the start. And, well, kind of lucky for us, people were less willing, certainly in 2023, to pay for those seats as well. And these are all the, the reasons that we've mentioned before. There was COVID-19 fallout, people had ref restructures, strategic refreshers, no longer able to pay for those seats. And yeah, we discovered that growing that partnership was unsustainable. You might ask at this point, why would we still back such a program if, if there is, is a decline? And, and that's a really fair question. I find actually it's still really useful for peer-to-peer -peer networking for researcher communities. If you have a need to teach people expertise in an introductory topic that they have no expertise in, the Carpentries Train the Trainer work will, um, instructor training, will provide you with a strong evidence-based uh, background to do that. And also the other thing that we saw in some of our um, New Zealand colleagues, um, Carpentry's new stuff that's coming up through the incubator is actually really interesting. We do like to kind of complain about um, the, the core lessons, but the curriculum in meteorology, ecology, astronomy and um, image analysis are some opportunities, I think, that are bringing us closer to what people actually want to learn. So what I'm thinking about now um, for our next train, uh, next Carpentries membership is to actually limit the instructor training side of that so that we can offer a small number of instructor training seats as a scholarship opportunity. Um, therefore, neatly sidestepping the, um, the necessary paying for things, really, or the, the tricky financial side and focusing our attentions on that community engagement and looking at sustainability. So we are also using our membership now to pay for trainer training, which um, is not the instructor training, but training the people who train the instructors. Thank you for staying with me in these meta-linguistic <laughs> choreographies. I'm thinking about ways that organisations now might be able to join our partnership beyond simply purchasing seats. Should we consider a model that includes individual members and what other national approaches to multidisciplinary research technology conferences like ResBaz might provide as an opportunity for these new instructors to uh, demonstrate their new skills and apply them? Yes, demonstrate and apply. And that's it for me. Uh, so, um, with barely a minute to spare, I'm going to move into our wrap-up. Right now, that actually means I have to go right to the back of the slide deck. So, just imagine you haven't really seen this. Just in case. So, thank you everybody for um, reaching the end of our, um, our online connection to Carpentry Connect today so this is this is the end if you would like to stay in touch with the ARDC please subscribe to our newsletter 
Um, and keep in mind, have I got, no, that's the wrong button, wrong way. Keep in mind this idea about International Data Week in 2025. So thinking about where you might like to see Carpentry's community develop um, and where it might be in 15 months' time. And oh, I think oh, I think that's it. Wait, I think I need to also go back to where our slide is for the evaluation form. Someone will help me find that. We'll just like imagine that we're doing a back in time thing. That's good. I mean, this is like it's a perfect recap. It's fast, <laughs> and it's not what I would be doing if I was running a. Carpentry's workshop, but ah, aha, through the welcome pack. So, as we all like to say at um, the Carpentry's, like, tell us your feedback, let us know, tell us something good, something that you would like to see or an improvement for next time. So, through that welcome pack is a link to our evaluation form. Please do that. Um, in Melbourne here, we're about to break for lunch and um, then we will move into uh, an engagement pathway session and the revitalising Git workshop. Um, farewell for now, and thank you everybody, our wonderful speakers today, um, uh, out there and in here, and I look forward to hearing more from you. The end. <laughs>